To celebrate a year of Telecast, we've teamed up with Workshare Consulting to launch the Telecast Workshare Content Industry Monitor. Taking the pulse of the global business of TV, this exclusive regular survey will analyse your views to find out how the TV business feels about the key issues it faces today. So we're asking all of our listeners from producers to financiers, from distributors to networks and everyone in between to please take a few minutes to fill out our survey. We're asking about how confident you feel about your job or business, how you've been impacted by the lockdown, both personally and professionally, how the industry leaders have performed, about virtual markets and events, and the return to a new normal working life and industry recovery. Just go to telecast-podcast.com forward slash survey to complete it. It'll only take 10 minutes and you'll be helping take the temperature of the global TV industry right now. Plus, we'll send you a copy of the full results when we publish in April. Thanks a lot. Telecast, the TV industry news review. Brand funded programme. What is it? What are the different funding models? And what are the pitfalls? Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, my guests Claire Thompson of K7 Media, Aaron Malyars from Insight TV, and Apex Content Ventures' John Nolan discuss all this and more. Plus, some bright news at last for commercial broadcasters, as TV advertising looks set to explode as City AM Analyst of the Year Ian Whitaker talks us through his forecast for the months ahead. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. This week's show is sponsored by Insight TV, who passionately create and share content for the experienced generation. Channel provider, content producer, distributor and format seller, Insight TV delivers real-world stories about the adventures, cultural trends and social causes that resonate with today's millennial and Gen Z audiences. Based upon and inspired by social media trends and influencers, Insight TV operates and distributes a flagship lifestyle channel in vivid 4K UHD HDR quality to 315 million homes in 46 countries via linear cable platforms, digital smart TVs, OTT services, and via watchinsight.tv. It also distributes a mobile-first short-form channel in short, action sports channel in trouble, science and tech channel in wonder, and a nature and wildlife channel in wild, a co-venture with Off The Fence, to fast channels and mobile services around the world. Insight TV partners with global brands and broadcasters, such as Red Bull Media House, G2 Esports, Vice Media and BT Sports to create factual series like Epic Exploring, I Am Invincible and Ultimate Goal. To find out how to do great things together with Insight TV, visit insight.tv or get in touch with the team at marketing at insight.tv. My guests this week are Claire Thompson, Non-Executive Director at TV Intelligence Business K7 Media, Aaron Malyars, Vice President of Content and Channels at Insight TV, and John Nolan, Managing Director of Apex Content Ventures, which is part of Publicis Group. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hey, Justin. Hi, Justin. Great to have you all on and talking about brand-funded content. Now, Claire, coming to you first, K7 Media recently published a comprehensive report on the subject. Can you tell us a little bit about it? We decided, I think, towards the end of last year, around September or October, that it was one of the areas that we wanted to look at. So I write sort of regular insight reports for the company every couple of months on different subjects, sometimes genre-based. Um, but in this case, we thought brand-funded programming, there'd been 
a lot of publicity around channels like Channel 4, talking about how they were going to be using more brand funded programming to kind of plug the gap that they were foreseeing in advertising spend um, and, and other territories too, looking at ways, particularly in this particular year, to, to sort of address some of the funding issues that they were having. And I mean, brand funded content's been around a long time. Um, it's not new. But it felt like this was um, a good time to look at it again. And it was having this sort of resurgence. So we ended up talking to, I think it was in the end, 26 different people from around the world because we have clients um, all around the world. I and some of my colleagues, we spoke to people, broadcasters, producers, agencies, brands, um, everywhere really, UK, Europe, Asia, Australia, America. And the, the report became sort of more and more unwieldy the more people that we spoke to. So in the end, what we decided to do was, was I kind of put together an executive summary of some of the, the key themes. But then we actually ended up printing all of the interviews in full as part of the report because, you know, people can read the ones that are relevant to their territory. But there were so many um, kind of interesting points in there. Um, and, and obviously, it did prove to be such a sort of different picture in each territory as well that there were there was a lot of content oh, we're delighted that you've kindly shared it with uh, telecast listeners so it's available on our website on the uh, download section we'll put a link in the episode description so everybody could go there and download it and, and have a look it's really good aaron coming to you so insight tv uh, you're a global millennial focus lifestyle channel available via cable, OTT, and smart TV platforms, and you also run a number of short-form channels. How important is brand-funded programming to your business? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I was glad that is right. It's not, not something new, you know. I've, five years ago, I was on MasterChef and EP, and, and we did already branded sections there. It's more, uh, and I think, you know, and every year we speak about these things, saying, that, okay, when is actually you know, branded content or co-branded content, whatever we like to call it, taking off because it, it does take a while before the big boom hits. Uh, I, I don't even know the answer to that, but, you know, to how important it, it is to us. Um, I believe uh, sincerely that if you work together with some of the brands, uh, we are open to editorial um, input from, from content creators, uh, brands and, and, and creators can make each other stronger. You know, a lot of traditional people still look at uh, branded content or brands connected to a show as, oh, you know, I like to have, you know, uh, in, independency on creative side. But like, yeah, so like I have an example where we're doing now a show with uh, with Red Bull Media House on um, uh, uh, on break dancing. So we, so we travel the world, a little difficult right now, but that, that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do where we find uh, cultural differences between, you know, different breaking uh, and, and music styles. Um, but with Red Bull, Red Bull is, you know, they, they started the World Championship BC1 around breakdancing, and now in four years it will become an Olympic sport. No one else on the planet has more knowledge about breaking and breakdancing than they are. So that actually helps the show. It helps show so much to, to, to become more credible and become better with the talents as well. Uh, same thing we're doing with uh, Monster Energy because we, we also work with them, telling stories around a VR46 and 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 the next uh, Prince on in 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 the MotoGP, for instance, uh, after Valentino Rossi, um, uh, which is Franco Morbidelli. We told that story. That story is so strong, not even about motorsport, but about a personal story that uh, that, that brand makes the show actually stronger instead of its in its way. So to come back to the question, is it important? Yes, I think if we do it right. Uh, we can we can we can maybe only tell better stories across the board. Yeah, and the two examples you gave, obviously, the brand is integral to the story, and presumably that's key. And we'll come and touch a little bit more on that. Um, but before we do, one one question that I had for you, Aaron, is that the millennial audience that Insight TV serves are they more open to? overtly branded or brand funded content than perhaps boomers are or gen z or gen y some of the other the other age groups that other broadcasters serve do you think they're very open to to brand funded content your viewers my immediate go to would be yes because you know they rather have content which are branded features in the content than ad breaks uh then having said it's also the 
the matter uh, how you do it, right? If it's too much in your face and it becomes unbelievable and uncredible to, you know, to, to the story, uh, I just you, you cannot have McDonald's sponsoring uh, a cooking show. Uh, however, they might like that. Mm-hmm. It's just difficult to, you know, to to connect those two topics to each other. So in, in my head, it always needs to be something which is connected to the topic so it has a natural integration. And if it's fit natural, then like, I think, you know, the audience is definitely more open to, uh, to it than other audiences. John, welcome to Telecast. For those who don't know Apex content, tell us a, a little bit about the business and what you do. No, thanks for having me on. Thanks very much indeed. So Apex is part of Publicist Group. Publicist Group, an advertising agency group, It has uh, creative agencies and media agencies. Best way to describe that is the creative agencies, although they would both media agencies and creative agencies are are, are constantly uh, debating this. Creative agencies do the colouring in and media agencies do the counting. I'd say creative agencies make the advertising and media agencies plan and find the audiences and then buy the space, although those kind of relationships are, are fluid. Uh, Apex is part of the publicist group and not actually an agency. So we don't have any clients. We act on behalf of the group. Best way in which I could describe my hilarious job is uh, I write checks. So uh, we go around the world uh, writing uh, checks to broadcasters uh, predominantly uh, to help them fund content. And we do that with our own cash up front. What a brilliant job. I mean, that must make you the most popular man in TV. It took something like that to make me popular. (laughs) The really scary thing about lockdown is that my children, having been at home, now go, Dad, we realise that what you really do for a living is talk. (laughs) I think there's a couple of things really interesting in in what Claire and Aaron were just saying there I I just want to pick up on. And that is, let's say the group spends somewhere or in the region of 50 billion US dollars of clients investment in advertising in a year. Uh, That's an approximate made up figure. That goes to fund content. So advertising funds content is what it does. So I'd say probably my job is to promote free to air content that's funded by advertising around the world and, and help make that easier for free to air broadcasters to buy more content. And we do that directly uh, with our own cash. Does that make sense? Yes and no, uh, is my answer to that. <laughs> and we'll maybe come and talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. Let's start off by agreeing what the term is for this particular category. Is it brand-funded content? Is it advertiser-funded programming? What what has it become known as? Claire, What's what, what do you understand, having spoken to all of these people, around the world it was it was quite strange actually at the beginning of ringing around everybody and talking everybody had their own preferred term and some people felt quite strongly about it um there was a a sort of uh i think branded entertainment has become quite a popular phrase um with people stressing now very much that it's about entertainment for first and foremost now this kind of content has to be entertaining to bring audiences to it and the fact that a brand is funding it is sort of secondary but that obviously applies often you know people like Sam Glynn at Fremantle that I spoke to some of the the people that were working very much in the kind of entertainment end of, of brand funded programming you know obviously that was the sort of area that they were and that was the terminology that they were using but there are lots of brands funding kind of one-off documentaries which you know is again a very different thing I mean one of the things that I thought was quite interesting was that there seemed to be just a desire to move slightly away from the phrase AFP which was what the kind of most common name was sort of 10 years ago or so and I think there was a kind of feeling that there was a lot of excitement around AFP at at one point and then it, it never kind of quite took off as everybody hoped it would and now by sort of changing it to BFP or brand funded programming it's kind of it's sort of signifying maybe a new era but also a more flexible approach there's so many different it's not just advertisers paying money there are co-developments there's different finance models there's sponsorship there's all sorts of different assets around a piece of content it's more fluid so I think people kind of wanted to perhaps signify that with a a slight shift of name but you know they all mean essentially the same thing um, at the end of the day 
But it's quite a significant difference, isn't it? If you think that advertiser funded programming, to me, conjures up, you know, that's it. Literally, we take, we're taking a block of a media time and we're branding it. Mm. But when we're talking about brand funded programming, brands are always trying to communicate or many of them are not all of them, but many of them are trying to communicate emotionally. And they've yeah. worked out emotionally that uh, the emotional connections is what really, you know, what stimulates consumers to action, as in to buy their products or to 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 do whatever it is they want them to do. It's more kind of acknowledging a slightly more perhaps subtle approach. It's not the Pepsi chart show so much now. It, it's more about kind of conveying, yes, the ethos of your brand in a in a program that sort of suits its values essentially the, the one thing nobody's ever asked me is is are you sure that's what it's called I, I think it's probably a bit of a red herring the principal point here or the important point is one of transparency and to your point Aaron earlier about millennials and, and engaging with the content I, I, I don't think people tend to be that concerned about the funding model what they really want to know is if somebody did fund this in order to try and sell you something that they are honest about it and that it has some integrity and transparency of the relationship. So again, whether it's brand funded, advertiser funded, branded entertainment, that's really a means of saying, hey, there's someone else involved in, in this. And, and it's really important that that's communicated. I, I would also say there's a great deal of education gone on in the, since 10 years ago in, in the in the foot. Well, let's call it the AFP boom of, of the early 21st century. And, and, and the message there is if you want advertising, buy it. And if you want programming, it's a different set of rules. And so whether it's entertaining or not is, is, is really an education process for advertisers. Advertisers are very used to buying audiences. That's how they transact. A commercial keeps continues to be shown until it reaches a certain critical audience. You can't buy audiences with content. You have to attract audiences. They have to want to watch it. So to your point, Aaron, about you know, is it valid? Does it have integrity? You have to balance that again with the transparency. Like you mentioned, Claire, it's not about having your name in the title anymore. It's about making something that people want to watch. So I don't think the issue is what, it, what the funding mechanism is called. We don't refer to drama as internationally funded matrix bank financed drama featuring John Sim. <laughs> if it's good, we'll watch it. That there is a difference also, I would say, in, in between... Uh, bad marketeers, I would say, or, or good marketeers in the sense on content. You, you still have a lot of, you know, briefings where they want to, you know, put the brand in the title. You know, I want to see the logo five five times, you know, instead of like we need to, you know, connect with it emotionally because, you know, if people like the story uh, and you have a, you know, you have a good feeling with the story or, or at least you have emotion uh, together with it, that will also affect the brand. We're now doing a show with, with Kestrel Beer to revive, you know, this uh, um, a great brand in the UK and we're making a show uh, where, where the family bought a really old car and tried to do, you know, record world speed records on, on a track. You know, that story alone would already be good for, for a series. That is branded. It's just, it's just helping a lot. Uh, and, and it will have its effect also on, uh, on that brand in particular. So it's always a balance, I think, in terms of editorial. So I think we're always saying, saying the same thing. If people like watching it and it's, you know, it's brand funded, yeah, they don't care as long as they like the entertainment part of it. Yeah. Looking at, let's call it brand funded content then. Let's stick on, on that as a, as a catch-all term. Why is it becoming more prevalent and more important right now? I mean, we can obviously see that AVODs growing. We see SVODs have obviously grown, as we know, over the last year of lockdown. We're also seeing a lot of content that is being produced, premium content. More and more of that is going behind the gates of the SVODs. So brands, obviously, have got a lot less premium content to reach their audiences by, you know, advertising next to. So presumably, this is the beginning of a development of brands needing to connect with their audiences and being able to connect with their audiences, as we said, emotionally through really great content that, that speaks to what their brand ethos is. Do we see it being 
more and more prevalent? Do we see that it's it's, it's going to be a growth area? John, is that is it something that you're looking at and thinking the next five years we're going to see a massive increase in brand-funded content? I don't ever want to predict the future. I'd be running a casino if I had that talent. For me, your question is one really about audience behaviour. And as audiences start to engage more and more with non-advertiser-supported platforms and subscription delivery, where they where audiences pay directly for content rather than, let's say, rent their eyeballs out to commercial messages, then that does put two forms of pressures on advertiser-funded platforms. One is the scarcity of the audience, and the other is inflationary pressure on the content. The subscription services are outspending you know, the larger networks on their cost per hour. We are in a golden age of content. There's more great stuff being made today than has ever been made. And I don't have enough time to bin watch everything on my A list, let alone my all would be quite nice list. So I, I think the kind of the challenge is how do we as people in the business of funding content engage with audiences and give them a choice, either to pay for it directly or to watch these commercials. And I think we've ignored a massive structural change. And that is content delivery is now not just about network television. And people's time is not just about TV. You know, I have children who spend all their time never on linear free-to-air television. They will watch three-minute clips on a social media platform all night. And so for me, it's about how do I encourage advertisers to engage with the great content on linear television more. So I think that's where the challenge for advertising and for clients is how do you continue to make advertising on television relevant? It is still incredibly relevant. 11 and a half million people watched an interview program on primetime television last night. At the time we were recording, this was the Meghan and Harry interview, and that's in the UK. The death of linear advertiser funded television was heralded 20 years ago, 10 years ago. It's still beating strong and still delivering mass audiences. Advertiser funded advertiser inspired content will always and has always been a rich part of that mix i would say but do you feel that the reducing audiences because yeah you you mentioned the uh, megan and harry interview that was an anomaly really wasn't it i mean what we're seeing on the in the long term is we're seeing um linear tv audiences reducing massive structural change towards you know different ways of paying for stuff but I, I would say on the SVOD subscription video on demand service, we're kind of, I, I will say we're at peak SVOD. Uh, and I'm, you know, I look at my own spend on SVOD and I'm probably at the top. I'm not prepared to spend any more. I quite like AVOD next and advertiser funded platforms. So I, I'd, I'd say, again, it's too early to predict the death of advertiser funded content opportunities. Claire, you you mentioned in your report three main different models. There were many more. Um, I mean, the the, the sort of three that we kicked off with. um, So in talking to um, Samantha Glynn, who um, runs the brand funded content arm of of Fremantle, I mean, their three models are the kind of start, the model one where you start with an actual show. And obviously for a big company like Fremantle, they have a lot of um, old shows in their catalogue, shows that they're um, perhaps reviving. So um, they've had examples like, um, say, Supermarket Sweep, where they want to bring that show back and then they look for a brand to partner with on that, in that case, um, with Tesco. Um, so that's sort of model one. They go out, they find the brand, they say, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, um, and Tesco agree that if it's on ITV, then yes, they, they will fund it. Um, and then there's the second model, which is that the brand comes with the request to develop a show um, for them. So um, Channel 4 are doing this very, very regularly at the moment. They put out regular briefs to production companies from from the brands. Uh, brands are looking for a particular show around um, X, Y or Z area that might um, sort of speak to their to their values. And then they will ask the producers to pitch into that um, brief. And then there's the, the, the model that media agencies are are program financing so so the the example that that, that john talked about um that, that apex do so which where they're financing shows either in exchange for unsold ad inventory or, or or whatever their particular model is and then there were other kind of 
smaller models that people referenced. So actually co-developing with a media agent or creative agency, for example, but they can sometimes be a little bit harder to get off the ground. And I think, I mean, talking to say Paul Tremaine at Mediacom, their view was very much that it really helps to know what commissioners are looking for or what shows they want to make and commission but can't quite afford and to start from that starting point rather than going into them with ideas. So they spend a lot of time talking to commissioners and saying, you know, what do you really want to make but just have got a bit of a gap on and then they'll bring in the brands to to help fund, fund that gap. Aaron, as a broadcaster, how do you tend to work with brands? Are either of those three models uh, familiar to you? Yeah, no, no, definitely. And it's the traditional ones. Uh, like I think they've been for, for a while now. Um, it can work both ways. It really depends on on the brand. Uh, when you start a conversation and the brand likes, okay, you know, we like we have a story here or we are, you know, interesting in a certain topic, uh, should, should we develop something together? And I always nosebleed the conversation saying, okay, you know, that's fine. But like editorial goes first. If you immediately get the sense like, okay, this is basically we're going to make a, you know, a commercial only longer. There's no value in that, even though, you know, we might get 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 fund, funds in. It's just not the right way to go to make a good case. So I will give the example, for instance, with um, uh, uh, the other one where we have a show and we're like to look for a brand. So we did a show around esports, uh, gaming, which is called Making the Squad. We did it together with Pringles. Pringles is not, in, in my head, the first brand to be associated with gaming and esports. But it makes sense in the end because, you know, what are what are you doing when you're gaming? When, when you guys are gaming, what do you do? Like <laughs> um, uh, snacking, right? So uh, that only makes sense. Uh, and it's, it's one of the key pillars to be connected with esports and gaming in general. That, that fit worked. Uh, not as much in the show, of course, there was branding, but also outside the show. So in terms of short form content, extra uh, uh, connection with the show through, you know, um, a viral video. So it's it's a whole package what you what you can co-create with a brand if a brand is open to it. And if you have the right creative uh, marketing manager or brand manager, you can do you can do a lot. Also, you know, brand funded programming is more prevalent and more accepted, if you like, in different territories around the world, some more so than in others. And obviously, some countries are also more tightly governed, or in fact, they they may have bans in place in terms of of brands getting involved with programming. John, in terms of the best markets for brand collaborations, what would you say the best and and emerging markets for brand-funded programming opportunities? I'm going to answer that in two ways, but not to be difficult. The the, the best market for 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 ideas is here, the UK. Uh, I, I tell that, of course, because I live here and I've worked here uh, for, 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 for over 20 years before joining Publicis. I was at the company that became All3 Media. And, and the last company I ran there was a specific agency that just raised money from agencies and brands to create content. Uh, and that company had complete access to the development slate of the All3 Media Group. That's a really powerful tool to go into agencies and broadcasters around the world is here is a creative engine that will devote its time and its energy to creating fantastic programs for you. It's it, it, it's the same thing that Sam at Fremantle has, um, and a, on all the big television production groups have that. From a regulatory position, I think also the UK has very tight regulatory conditions, and rightly so. I think loose conditions you could look at as rope in that they give people permission to go and do things that they really shouldn't be doing. But I don't think properly educated brands or agencies want to do bad things. They want to be taught what is the right thing to do. And your question, coming to the second point, is really one about cultural sensitivity. So there are some markets where it's really important that there's a brand involved in the game show because if there's a brand involved, that means that communicates to the audience that it's really good because the brand is prepared to put its name into the show. Whereas in some other markets, that's, that just seems like madness. Uh, there are other markets where the, there's a linear relationship between brand involvement and funding. So if you don't have a brand involved, then the show is not going to be repeated. It's very rare, for instance, in the US for a sponsor to come on board in season one, 
So a network will go up front without the phrases up front, will go up front without a sponsor and commission the show, hoping the sponsorship comes on board. What we've been trying to do is interrupt that process and help fund for clients or fund directly in season one and take that risk. So I, I think your question is one about cultural acceptance of brand involvement, but also about the different value of ideas in different markets. The UK is, a, is an idea exporter. Uh, Holland is an idea exporter. The US is an idea exporter. It's where the big formats are coming from at the moment until it's fashionable for them to come from somewhere else. Claire, I, I noticed in your report there was a lot of discussion about China. And actually China, um, and in many cases, we see brands like Apple and uh, you know, a lot of the, the, some of the biggest brands in the world are actually getting involved with brand-funded programming. And actually, many of these shows, if you haven't got a brand, the show doesn't get made because the, the networks don't have budgets to commission. Is that, is that right? Am I, am I right in saying that? Yeah, I work a lot with Chinese broadcasters and producers, and it took me a long time actually to get my head around it. It's it's sort of almost entirely the opposite um, model to here. And someone described it to me as being, I mean, it's a bit of a rude word, <laughs> the worst of all worlds, which is that it's extremely regulated, but entirely commercially driven. Yes, programs have to have brand investment sponsorship right up front before um, they are commissioned. But normally what happens is that there are several partners anything from sort of you know five to ten main sponsors on a show and they have to be all be brought on board before a show is commissioned but but interestingly they're sort of almost going the other way in that while they are completely used to having brands all over a, a piece of content brands themselves are now starting to see that actually it's not great to be one of eight or ten brands i mean you can pay more to be the lead brand but actually they are also more interested now in more bespoke content development where their particular brand value is attached to a show, their sort of vision, um, and it's a little bit more exclusive to them. So, you know, that they're sort of coming back almost in the other direction from having brands all over it to, to perhaps a slightly more subtle or, or brand-specific um, approach as well. They're both measures of confidence, though, aren't they, really, Claire, mm. in terms of, you know, the confidence for a network to commission something is if commercial partners are prepared to come on board, it's not just us that thinks it's a good idea or commercial partners think it's a good idea. And if a commercial partner says, hey, do you know what? We think this is such a good idea. We don't want anyone else in the room with us. We, we want to kind of buy our exclusive place at the table. That's a real kind of signaling to a broadcaster that we might be onto something here. There's, there's a commercial reality. It is, although there is one um, sort of caveat to that, which a lot of Chinese producers and broadcasters have sort of talked about, which is that in, in China, you know, because no, no one can guarantee the success of a show, any kind of show, you know, it's very hard. And their only sort of benchmark for whether something is going to be successful is often the level of celebrity talent attached, which means that the kind of price of the biggest celebrity talent names it is just the thing that determines everything. And without that huge name, you know, the, the advertiser says, okay, so if you've got Justin Timberlake on board, you're yeah, brilliant. Okay, we'll fund it. And if you haven't, then then no. And so the kind of power in the hands of the, of the biggest sort of Chinese and international celebrities in that market is even greater than it is perhaps elsewhere, because that's what the brands are sort of placing their bets on, and more perhaps than on the idea itself, which might be more the case in the UK. UK, um, that it that it's as much about the idea as well. So I think that that has been a bit of a trap for them, which they, they they've also um, now found. From China, so we we are doing um, a project with CCTV and uh, two other ones uh, with, with TV manufacturers in China, but they also they also look vice versa. So if we have a project and we have these brainstorms, you know, uh, some of those companies ask like, can we? Uh, do the same show if they like it, the core element, and then not with celebrities, but, but at least the core element of the format. Can we do that? Can we do an international version and a Chinese version? So, you know, we can broadcast this one in Europe and this one in China. Uh, and, and this far, they're, they're pretty open to it because our budgets are not that high that we can just get just in terms like even if we ask, uh, you know, CCTV or someone else to pay for it. Uh, I like to more the route, well, we're from Holland, so more the route from the creativity. You know, we have here something pretty unique which ties into 
the two segments the brand likes to likes to cover and communicate and therefore it's more natural integration and if we can if we can do one production uh, in one go as a hub and an international version and Chinese version we're there so uh, this is interesting conversation sometimes it's just again it's about the right people you speak to, I would say. I thought that was fascinating. We had one example in our report, um, Beach House Pictures, who made um, Ed Stafford first man out for Discovery. And they did the, the second season was a was a co-pro with um, Billy Billy in China. And so they had to do the same. They had to do the Chinese version, which was fully kind of brand funded and had um, Chevrolet and another outdoor brand attached. But then the international version, which wasn't able to have any brand involvement. So they basically had to shoot sort of almost entirely two versions of the same show but at the same time and it was you know kind of outdoor survival show um which which sounded exhaustingly <laughs> complicated to do but in the end proved to be you know they, they they thought worth it and and as you say Aaron maybe a kind of interesting you know model that you can make different versions of the same same show one with a you know the brand involved and one without yeah that's both cultural and regulatory as well isn't yeah. it so I, I did do a show with Shell uh, for Discovery, uh, which had Tom Hardy, Adrian Brody, and Henry Cavill uh, going uh, doing expeditions in in the hottest road in the world, the coldest road in the world. You know, classic kind of uh, celebrity in a in a in jeopardy uh, position, and 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 you have to make different versions for different regulatory positions, but also you know for different cultural acceptance. You know, in some markets, it's it's a logo on the side of a car is acceptable, but in other markets, it's completely acceptable to do a product demonstration. Yeah, the UK is quite far along on the kind of aversion to being sold to sort of spectrum, and and France even more so. You know, for, for regulatory and taste reasons, it's one of the harder markets to um, to do it in as well. So yes, it is it is very different everywhere. Working with brands and agencies might be a completely new concept for producers working on their first brand funded programming project another very strong voice suddenly becoming involved in production and in editorial what are the challenges for the tv businesses working with media agencies and how should the TV industry seek to overcome those? John, coming to you on that. I mean, what, you've obviously worked on both sides of the coin. You've worked for all three or before it was all three, and you're now part of Publicis. So what, what are the friction areas? What are the common friction areas and, and how do you overcome them? Aaron just hinted to some of them, which is, you know, can our logo be in it? Can, you know, there was a classic conversation about can, can the presenter wear the red dress? Uh, because our logo is red, and 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 I'd say, and I say this on both sides of the fence. Just see who you're in the room with, and and is the idea you're doing? Does the idea make sense? If you're trying to force a brand into something, don't do it from a brand perspective or a production perspective. It's going to cause you trouble. I mean, the regulatory positions in terms of product placement are fairly clear in terms of undue prominence and editorial independence. I'd say make really good friends with your commissioning team and make sure that all of your partners are aware that it's the commissioning team and the broadcaster who are ultimately in charge of the output. I go. I said it earlier, if you want advertising as a client, go and buy advertising. If you want content, it's going to be slightly more nuanced and slightly you know, more delicate. And then flip that. If a broadcaster is paying you enough money to make the thing that they want you to make, then you don't need a brand involved. And it goes back to your earlier questions about, is there enough money to go around to fund everything everybody needs to make? And so it is about the relationships of the people you're in the room with and making sure that you're communicating what everybody needs to achieve. The brand might not want the presenter to wear the red tie and the red hat and the red dress. The, the, the brand might just be happy with the fact that they can put your program on their pack at the point of sale or use your talent to make extra short form extras they can communicate themselves. Uh, American television used to stop in the middle of the show and, and cross the studio to demonstrate the washing machine. You know, we're not at that stage again. I think audiences accepted that then because that was the commercial method and they understood that the washing machine manufacturer was bringing you that game show. And they had no option, though. They had no option. And, they, and, and, and there was no other way of doing it. There was a show on ITV in the UK in the 1950s called Jim's Inn. 
which was based on a pub. And, you know, the punters in the pub used to get, the, the landlord was called Jim and say, hey, Jim, that's a nice shirt. And you go, yeah, I bought this shirt from British Home Stores, three and sixpence. And that, that was the business model of funding that show back then. It's about trusting the people you're in the room with and, um, and having a common objective to what it is you want to make. If what you're making is a cooking show that shows the benefit of salad, then don't have a salad manufacturer who's going to want their pack of salad in every shot. But if you've got a, a brand who's interested in healthy eating and healthy living and being fit, then you're already about their brand if you're telling people how to make salad. They don't need to be in it in order to you know, build a relationship. So uh, the right idea made by the right people collaboratively works. It's quite difficult, though, isn't it? I mean, if you think, though, from a production perspective. But Justin, it's only like making the program for the wrong commissioning editor. If you're in the room with the wrong people, it's the project isn't going to go right anyway. Your question is about, are there too many people in the marriage? Yeah, well, I'm also, you know, I'm thinking if you're a, a, a produ producer making a show with a brand for the first time and the brand manager is used to advertising, to your point earlier on, and this is their first brand funded content project there's a lot of learning needs to go on on one project very very quickly <laughs> yeah I, i've been in that room i think we've all been, <laughs> yeah, we've all been in that room <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the the, the problem is it, that you know it, it's it, it's only too many cooks if none of the cooks kind of understand the recipe and and as long as you know it, it's just it's just about everybody kind of respecting the slightly different rules of each game that they're all playing. That, rules of the game. Yeah, yeah, and and that and then that and that is a kind of a learning process. And some for some brands it will be the first time they've done it, and for some producers it will be the first time they've done it. And what what it needs is those kind of ringleaders like. The people who have the role for example you know Simon Wells who's been doing it a long time now at Channel 4 or who can kind of you know make sure that everybody sort of understands what what they are able to push on and and, and what, what what not. Sounds like we need a referee on every project <laughs> before everybody goes into production there's a referee that talks about the rules of the game. And for everyone to know who the referee is as well. <laughs> yeah but there's a, there is a lot of knowledge in there so Simon has been agency, Simon has been producer and now Simon is broadcaster side. Sam Glynn at Fremantle has been agency side. I, I worked with Sam for a long long time at All3 Media and now she's gone back production side, and you understand those kind of dynamics. Yeah. So I go to look who you're in the room with and agree common objectives. The horror stories of what actually has happened on some projects is the book that will never be written. <laughs> and of the tantrums and of the fallouts. I've been fortunate enough to have been involved in three separate programmes, all of which were investigated by Ofcom. <laughs> and the first one was found completely innocent of all charges. One newspaper ran, uh, bro you know, I won't name the broadcaster or the project, but one newspaper ran, Ofcom warns broadcaster not to go further than it went. And, <laughs> and that's, oh, that means they, they went as far as they should go. But that was not a nice project to be involved in. That's another conversation, I think. Maybe we'll have a, we have the secret producer on our uh, Telecast Plus newsletter. Maybe do the secret branded producer to talk about. Aaron, how about some tips for producers getting involved in brand-funded programming? Producers that you've worked with in the past and worked with brands, is there any advice you could give producers, maybe even to producers that are going to approach you with projects, potentially with brands? Should they get their brand on board first and then come to you? Or what's your advice for them? Well, I'm going to ride uh, the way what, what John just said, like you know, know that you're speaking to the right people. Uh, at, at the brand side so many times you get like oh you know this is a show and we know that xyz brand is on board because i said it and then most of the time you know these people so you just phone them and say hey this is this true and then you know most sometimes they don't even know about it or like four months in a pitch meeting they said yeah i like this maybe if xyz yeah it, it, it's important to to um speak to the right people always uh, and that, that doesn't necessarily mean the highest person or like in, in the hierarchy it's more finding your champion within the organization to get something done if if you're speaking to the right to the right people maybe they can you can phone john first to make sure that they speak to the right people and then to me uh if if, if everyone knows them who has been longer in the industry just 
uh, shouldn't over two hours like this is a concept which fits inside V. That's that's the first, and then you know this brand is interested is interested and it is a natural fit because of X Y Z. Uh, yeah, uh, and then after you go into you know production on the creator side, but also production side, just be really clear. You know what do you want from from the show? If it's just pure advertising. Uh, yeah, like like being said earlier, that's something you can buy. You know, if you're doing content stuff, this is totally different. Um, so be prepared for that. And if, if the brand's not up for that or it's difficult, then yeah, it's difficult. But sometimes walk away from a bad project uh, is you know will save more money and will be better in the end than uh, than forcing it through. John, how about you? What's your tip for a producer getting involved in brand funded programming? Run away. <laughs> No, I'd say look at who you're in the room with and do you have a common purpose? I would say production is um, – that there's a culture clash, I think, between marketing and production. Oh, huge, huge, John, huge. Yeah, right. Yeah, ma- marketing is process-driven and it doesn't matter what anything ends up being like as long as you follow the process sometimes, whereas production is product-driven. You know, it has to be on air on Monday at 9 o'clock and it has to cost this. And no matter what happens, it will be ready. Whereas in marketing, if it's not right, we're going to take time to get it right. And the two processes are different cultures. And I think understanding that culture clash is the biggest learning I've, 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 I've had. Right. And do you think the modern production company, the, new, the production business of the 21st century, should have a brand-funded programming expert on board? as a full-time member of development to to smooth over all these wrinkles that uh, that could exist? No, I think a modern production company should have an expert in understanding how content is funded in the first place. And, and there's more than one way to fund content. And the business model of funding should not be the defining feature of what gets made. I think really smart broadcasters have made that leap. The, the broadcast of the future will have a subscription service, a subscription on demand service, and as much as you can eat buffet service and a free-to-air linear advertiser supported service. That business model doesn't get in the way of the broadcaster communicating with its viewer, and the business model should not get in the way of the producer being able to raise the funds to sell to the broadcaster. Uh, so you know, it surprises me where people don't understand how broadcasters are funded in the first place. I think that's a more fundamental question, is understand how the money is being raised from the broadcaster. They don't go to the magic money tree and the funds arrive to fund your show. They have to go and raise the money themselves. So now is the time in the show where my guests get to choose the TV industry story of the week that's interested them most over the past seven days. Claire, what's your story of the week? It might appear a little UK centric, but I think for me, it's still the, the the fact of BBC Three returning as a linear channel. And I just think, given that everything we've been talking about in terms of, um, you know, SVOD and AVOD and this on on demand world, particularly supposedly for the younger generation, I think it's just so uh, fascinating that six years on, BBC Three is going back to being a linear channel. And I guess it speaks to the other point that you know, does a linear channel exist almost purely? as a marketing um, reference point rather than as an actual viewing reference point. And it's not until something still has that kind of kudos and place in people's minds that it exists as being worthy of of, of substantial spend um, rather than how people choose to watch it. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's it's, it's all about the publicity engine driving the budget in that case. Um, so it'll be fascinating to see what impact that has on, on the BBC and, and the younger audiences that it, it needs to keep attracting. Yeah, absolutely. And the home of so much great creativity over the mm. last few years as well when it comes to Fleabag and lots of other shows that have come from BBC Three. So whatever happens, you know, however successful it, it, it's going to be, let's hope there's more creativity and great shows coming yeah. coming from that stable. Yeah, Aaron, what's your story of the week? I'm not sure why the image stuck in my head. Is the, um, uh, is the, the, the nun in, in Myanmar was you know standing in between the police and the army and and um, and the villagers on this protest there, and like you know in in this day and age that also the police was kneeling when they saw the nun uh, and just not going through with you know with attacking the the villagers and the protesters in that village, that's something you know you don't see very often anymore I would say, um, 
yeah, I think that was, you know, pretty remarkable and um, sad, but yeah, it's it, it stuck in my head somehow. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll we'll include a link to everybody's stories of the week on the episode description. Uh, John, what's your story of the week? Uh, I mentioned it earlier. Mine is uh, has to be uh, Harry and Meghan, Meghan and Harry. I think it, in a world where we've all said it, it's it's linear television that has driven uh, a news agenda around uh, a soap opera in the UK. And that was funded by a network television in the US and repeated on free-to-air network television here in the UK. It's not a subscription service. It's not an online service. It's not a social media platform. It's good old-fashioned uh, linear television supported by advertising. And that's 11.3 million viewers on ITV, uh, which makes it the biggest non-news show of the year so far. And 17.1 million for CBS's broadcast, I think, which is more than the primetime Emmys and the Golden Globes put together. As you say, that's a, that's quite an audience. And ITV is a, apparently, we read in Deadline, that it's believed to have spent around £1 million on the interview, which uh, smart business, I guess. Uh, ad sales must have gone quite well against that. Yeah, and, and so, so that's why whenever someone predicts the death of linear free-to-air television, I always kind of go, I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> And now it's that time of the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. John, who's your hero of the week? Uh, my hero of the week is a English comedian called Richard Herring, who goes on Twitter on International Women's Day every year. And whenever somebody says, oh, International Women's Day, when is International Men's Day? He takes great delight in reminding them that it's sometime in September and advising them that if they took more time to research their subject, they would also might want to make a donation to a women and children's refuge. And to date, uh, this year, he's raised over £130,000 <laughs> <laughs> just by reminding idiots that there is an International Men's Day and they need to get a life. That's brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Aaron, what about you? Who's your hero of the week? Well, I, I, you know, I thought it was the, the 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 same story as I just mentioned earlier, but I joined I joined John in his hero of the week. That's priceless. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what about your bin? Who's going in your bin, Aaron? Well, actually, uh, as also mentioned here, I, I think I'm not sure if this is an entire thing or they should all get in one bin or separate bins. But the the royal family and and Prince Harry, <laughs> and, and, uh, because like. You know, the, yeah, I think it's just... We've all had enough of it, haven't we? Of course, entertainment to everyone, but it's also people's lives. And, you know, there's so much more important things going on right now than this, I would say. Or or maybe it is a good thing. I just don't know. I, I think it's distracting from, from the bigger picture in, in, in the world. But also maybe if it, if, it, if it provides people with comfort and entertainment, maybe it's a good thing as well. Yeah. Maybe you're right. Absolutely. Claire, how about you? Who or what's going in your bin? Well, th- this is exactly, I just got entirely stuck on this question because I couldn't decide whether Meghan and Harry were either hero of the week or get in the bin. And I, 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 and I still, whenever anyone says to me, oh, Meghan, you know, what side do you want? I just, I'm, I, I'm just exhausted by trying to decide whether they're either doing the world's greatest public service in, as Aaron says, distracting us from the bigger questions or, or, or should just all need to be quiet and go home. And and because I, I just can't, literally cannot make up my mind about that. So for me, they are both hero and in the bin, I think. Yeah, it's, it's the royal debacles going and, in your bin. And, I, and I'm just sort of, I'm exhausted by having to, to be black or white on every single subject um, these days. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm staying firmly in the shades of grey. <laughs> yeah, okay. And John, how about you? What's going in your bin? I think it's a Channel 4 presenter who has been dropped by the channel for his views being incompatible with those of the channel. And that's uh, a a guy called Ant Middleton. And there's a number of stories uh, circulating about uh, inappropriate behaviour and bullying. And I I would say banter as a defence is usually a kind of sign that uh, something somewhere wasn't really right. Uh, And and to Claire's point of shades of grey, it's really easy to take the high road and apologise and do the right thing. Why blame everyone else that you weren't bullying and it was only just banter? I, I don't get it. Claire, Aaron, 
John, thank you so much for coming on Telecast this week. It's been a fascinating conversation about brand-funded programming. A lot more to talk about, obviously. Uh, we've also got the uh, the report that Claire's put together. That's on the Telecast website. So go there and uh, and download that for free, and you can have a look through that. It's a fascinating piece of work. Thanks a, a lot, guys. Thank you again, and see you very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Justin. Justin. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Justin. So as we're talking brands and TV and advertising this week, another interesting report I spotted was written by City AM Analyst of the Year, Ian Whitaker. Welcome back to the show, Ian. How are you doing? I'm all right, Justin, and great to be back. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, I'm looking out my window. It's a sunny day. You know, spring has sprung, definitely. You know, looking back, it's been a turbulent time, hasn't it, for commercial broadcasters in particular. And just this week, we've seen ITV posting its earnings and revealing an 11% reduction in ad revenue. What do you make of that? The results themselves are actually ahead of expectations, even though when you look at that drop, you think that may seem a bit bit strange. Sort of towards the end of the year, really what you had when it came to TV advertising was generally the, the end of the first quarter was impacted sort of when we started to get COVID. But the real damage obviously done in Q2 and Q3, advertisers pulling money off because they thought, well, sort of, of, do we necessarily want to spend? Do we want to conserve cash? And so forth. And that very much continues into Q3, obviously, with the pandemic measures. And sort of consumers sort of of a question mark over consumers and what, what they would spend and so on. As actually got out sort of for Q4, towards the end of the quarter, actually, what you did see was advertisers come back into the market. So, as I mentioned, for ITV's Q4 numbers, actually were better than expected. And indeed, at the earnings level, there was a significant leap for ITV versus consensus expectations. And that's why you've seen the shares actually perform quite strongly to, today. What's interesting, I think, about sort of here is, and it's always the case with ITV, there is very much people, and with any company, people look at what they did. But often what they're looking for more is what they're sort of talking about in the future. And if you look at ITV and what they're sort of guiding to, it's very, very interesting guidance coming through. So if you talk about Q1 being down, mainly because of the, the, the impacts in January and February, but if you look at the momentum that's building up in the market, in March they were talking about plus eight. But then the real sort of, of, of amazing figure is actually when you look into their guidance for April. They're talking at the moment for April, TV out of their total advertising revenue, so we'll include their VOD, uh, uh, revenues as well. But their total advertising revenue has been up 50 to 75% in April. Cool. And if you look at sort of very much the, the comments on the conference call today, they weren't given specific guidance on May and June, but the underlying message seemed to be was that the, there was advertising strength would, would continue. Very much sort of backs up what we've heard from, for example, the Bank of England governor talking about strength in the economy. You had YouGov Consumer confidence numbers have been very good sort of, of the day before yesterday as well. So it really does feel as though from an advertising perspective that advertisers feel as though the consumer wants to get back to normal and there'll be this pent-up demand that will really sort of help drive the economy. You, you look at what the retail banks have been talking about, for example. You know, they've been talking about sort of the consumers have you know, large amounts of cash within their, their bank accounts that they're just wanting to spend when they can get back to normality. Now, for someone like an ITV, if you think about it, let's say for Q2, you, know, you go back last year, April, May, June, roughly the same sort of levels of performance. So there's going to be a very interesting question, I think, for them sort of as whether April's strength in terms of that 50 to 75 percent, how that continues in Q2, and particularly around June, because, of course, what you've got in June is you've got the Euros and then you've got the return of Love Island as well. So I think... When you look at the outlook for the commercial broadcasting space, actually sort of in the short term at least, actually looks quite positive. Some positivity is what we've been waiting for for a few months now. You've written a, a comprehensive report detailing five mega trends that you see developing this year when it comes to media and advertising. Before we look at those, can you set the scene a little bit in terms of what we've just been through in 2020? And what the outlook is now, particularly for TV brokers, you just touched on it there with ITV. But um, and obviously for many of our listeners, um, 
the outcome of that is all going to be, you know, content. Um, you know, is there going to be more content? Is it going to be more money for content to be uh, to be commissioned by commercial TV broadcasters? But yeah, just set the scene as to what we've just been through and those five mega trends you see developing throughout 2021. The message for 2020 was yes, it was bad from an advertising perspective, from a media perspective. But nowhere near as bad as people thought very much of the in the day of the of the pandemic. And if you go back to sort of the very early days of sort of talking Q2, definitely sort of companies thinking that they needed to conserve every single bit of cash that they had, concerns about mass unemployment, concerns about what would happen in terms of companies going bust and so forth. And what you've seen is obviously specific sectors, retail, for example, have been difficult. But if you look at the general macro picture and what's been happening, the message from the year for, from the year was very much of improving trends as you went out. And this was both if you look, for example, at the general economic data in terms of Bank of England, the OBR forecasts, talking about what they were expecting for unemployment rates and so forth, gradual improvements sort of, of coming through in their outlook throughout the year. Also as well on the advertising front, one of the very interesting things when you looked at the advertising numbers, sort of and this was particularly from a, a online space. Was that sort of actually online numbers are actually ad numbers were actually very strong, sort of of the number of players going out throughout the year and going into Q4, for example, you had Facebook up globally 35%, you had Snap up over 60%. Now, obviously, in terms of the TV space in the UK, that wasn't the case, although ITV was up. What has been an interesting sort of, of thing to note, though, and this has been very much the case across concert in Europe, is that the advertising numbers for the broadcasters have been better than expected. So, yeah, this is not just a UK phenomenon. It's been the case when it comes to Germany, sort of uh, with what ProSieben recently reported. It also as well, sort of, of, if you look at the picture in Spain and some degree in Italy as well. Yeah, actually, the broadcasters have held up better than, than what expectations were. And what seems to be happening here is that advertisers already in Q4 were starting to realise that maybe things were not as bad as they had been in Q2. I think that sort of view has continued into 2021. And I think sort of, of there's two interesting points here, I'd say. One is for advertising in general. There's a very strong argument, and this is what I put in the, the, the report or to play that I've published, is there's a very strong argument for saying there should be a structural step up when it comes to advertising spend. For 2021, I expect the UK advertising market in total to be up 12.6%, actually to beat 2019 numbers. TV, I expect to be up around uh, 13.7% within that figure. But what should drive that is not just companies coming back from a cyclical standpoint, but also as well these structural drivers. So money being taken out, for example, from areas such as travel and property and being put into advertising. Mondelez has talked about that. Also as well that you've got new companies with new business models that have come into the market and need to advertise there seems to be an element of some companies shifting into brand, which is one thing we're definitely sort of, of uh, approve of. And you know, also as well, e-commerce is going to be a big driver, mainly because sort of in an e-commerce environment, what sort of companies need to do is because more power lies with the intermediary, it's going to be increasingly important, I think, for many brands to actually spend on that advertising in order to get their message across to advertisers. So, so tell us about this. Uh, the, your first mega trend. What do you see as being the first mega trend for for twenty twenty one? Well, the first one is a cost led recovery, and I, I think for many firms there is still very much of an emphasis that they do want to control costs. But as I pointed out before, I think what's going to be interesting is firms have taken a fundamental look at their cost bases, and what you could see is that you could see money being shifted into advertising, but increasingly evidence suggests. That it generates a, a return. So, if you look at the analysis by companies such as BP, also as well in the banking sector, you know, talk they're reducing property costs sort of are on a permanent basis as, as things really change. And, and of course, travel is another area that you would argue sort of should see a permanent strip, uh, step down as well. So, there's an opportunity here really for for some of that money to be diverted across into advertising. I think there's no doubt. But for many companies, you know, what they are concerned about is a volatile environment. They don't know what will happen in terms of over the next 12 months. But there's certainly, when you listen to the company results that have been coming through, we are in the middle of reporting season. So there does seem to be sort of a, a message coming through from companies that you know, the outlook is better than expected. And you were therefore sort of expecting that sort of environment for companies to start to think about more investing in order to grow sales. And mega trend two is maximizing shareholder value. 
And this is an important point, probably the single most important point to try to say within the, the note is to say that advertising for a long time has not been taken as seriously enough as it should be by company managements at the CEO, the CFO level and the board level. And the, the analogy I would have is that advertising is in tangible capex. Just as a firm spends on a physical plant to, let's say, produce cars to grow sales, so they invest in their advertising in order then to actually grow their top line through brand strength. The problem has been is that many companies do not actually have, have not taken their responsibility seriously enough within that space. Advertising is seen as something that's very much the remit of the CMO, sort of of and sort of left to that. Boards don't really get involved in it. If you look at the turnover of CMOs during the, the 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 sort of of the average life cycle, three years. Again, any other management function would be serious question marks raised of why there's such a rapid turnover that's coming through. And so, sort of what trying to calculate here was the loss of potential value from what I call an optimized ad spend, essentially ad spend that could have been spent elsewhere. And the figure I came up to over the forecast period was, was close to ninety billion pounds of lost shareholder value, sort of, of throughout the forecast period. Now, that's slightly conservative estimate because what it doesn't take into account is the potential benefit to top line growth that you would get from optimized ad spend. Here's a real life example Procter and Gamble, sort of, of several years back, sort of reimagined their advertising spend, talked about reducing waste, putting ad spend into better performing areas. What have been the results since then? Well, if you look to Procter and Gamble, the organic revenue growth rate has accelerated, the earnings growth has accelerated, they've just come out of their fiscal second quarter results. For the second quarter in a row, they've upped their top line guidance. And if you look at the share, the, the uh, increase in market capitalization over the past three years, it's been well over $110 billion. So there is real and a key part of that strategy has been realignment of advertising spend to grow top line sales and earnings. So you've got a real life example there of a company that really took it, it, its duties when it came to advertising seriously saw it as a core function, realign the ad spend to actually put, to make that spend better, and delivered sort of, of both top line and earnings growth, but also as well massive value for shareholders. And that is you know, the critical function of boards and CEOs and CFOs. And this is why I talk about in the note that really one of the things that look at this as a call to arms of is for advertisers really to take the, the debate sort of beyond the CMO level and really take it to where it should be, which is very much the CEO, CFO, and very much the board level. The third mega trend is about the advertising mix, isn't it? It's about what new mixes of advertising that we're going to see these Procter & Gambles or Unilevers spending, how they're going to mix their spend up across various different categories. How, how do you see that developing? Well, one one point that making in this note is that if you look at the, the split of UK advertising spending at the moment, the net and field talk about the optimal mix is 60% brand and 40% activation. If you actually sort of adjust for those sort of parts of ad spending that really are activation, sometimes called brands, so I would count banner ads, for example, in that category, UK advertising spending at the moment is actually the reverse proportion. It's around 40% brand building and 60% activation. So what call for is really a shift back to brand building, which... Yeah, you look at the UK adv- advertising market, yeah, it is one of the most digitally driven in the world. And there's a real disconnect there between the theory which states digital should lead to better performance and better sales. And what's actually happened in reality, which is the brand value of UK brands has fallen. But also as well, when you look at what consumers are spending in areas that are heavily influenced by, by advertising. So, for example, sort of household goods in terms of food and non-alcoholic drinks. Actually, there's no signs that digital advertising, the change to digital advertising, has had uh, an improving effect on what consumers spend. In fact, actually, quite the opposite. And sort of my view is here is that the big problem here has been search. You know, there is an issue with, with leakage within the system, no doubt about that. But it's been too much spent on activation. And the real culprit here is search, where, quite frankly, many firms have used it as a brand building tool, which is not really the case of, of what it should be. I mean, the example that you sort of in the note is to talk about uh, Adidas, you know, which when Google AdWords went down, realized that actually it'd been overpaying for product that wasn't really driving sales. And when they did the deep dive into their advertising, they realized that actually the assumptions sort of that they had held dear sort of actually weren't true. 
So I think what you need to get here is a realignment of the advertising spend and the way money is spent within the UK ad market. And that means better news for TV? Definitely. I think if you look at, you know, one of the, the sort of areas where, say, because what I've also produced here is I've produced normal forecasts, where I think the ad market will go, and then also as well what I call optimised forecasts, which is saying if advertisers become a lot more efficient in terms of where they spend, you know, this is what the advertising forecast would look like. And the major winner from that is actually television. Outdoors also a, a winner as well. I think there's three sort of what we'd call the trifecta of, of the three sort of, of strong building blocks of brand advertising, which would be TV, out of home and, and social media. I think they, they do very well. Now, what we'd say is this is not to say that you shouldn't spend an activation on brand or, or rather search. They have their place, no doubt about it. But I think when it comes to TV, you know, what would say is that TV has been underappreciated, I think, you know, both in terms of, of the audiences that Linear can develop, but also as well sort of in terms of AVOD, what that can deliver in audiences in the brand-safe environment. And I think, and this is a theory, so it'll be interesting to see whether sort of it, it comes out. But in a way, sort of what has happened may actually be sort of somewhat of a long-term positive for, for television in the sense that, that I think one of the biggest barriers that you had to, do, to for the for the TV broadcasters and persuading decision makers of the the usefulness of their product was that essentially pre pandemic decision makers would say, well, linear TV is dead. It's a product I don't want it. My children don't watch it. They're all on the iPads. We're watching Netflix and so forth. Mm. And so it was very hard to persuade sort of advertisers of the utility of television. I think one of the things the crisis has done has really brought home sort of, of to those decision makers just how useful. TV is as a product for reaching consumers. So yes, yeah, there's no doubt that linear TV viewing will continue to go gradually down. But I think for many of the decision makers who sort of have been over the years used to seeing TV, it's very much of a, a tool in decline. That what this crisis has shown is that actually sort of for sort of TV still remains very much the central sort of, of area for many households. And indeed, as maybe their own viewing habits have actually sort of, of uh, have adapted to what have gone on, they've maybe taken a more positive view of the broadcasting environment. Programmatic advertising is something that is a relatively new development that is presumably going to deliver a lot more efficiency, both to advertisers, but also to TV broadcasters as well. Well, that, that's definitely the theory. And I mean, the easiest way I always look at sort of programmatic is to, to take the example of how shares are traded. You see, you've got a, a buyer and a seller and, and sort of effectively sort of done an automated sort of programmatic way. And that's very much sort of, of the, the theory that goes behind in terms of programmatic trading for, for media slots. It's something that for a long time, actually, the broadcast has resisted, mainly because, part because the, the, the internal setup wasn't really set up for that system, but also as well, sort of there was an area, of, sort of there was a concern about the loss of pricing power from moving to that sort of environment. Now, what you're seeing is that particularly as you've got broadcasters now offering AVOD along linear TV and that being increasingly bundled into a single offer to advertisers, that, that sort of that's very much changing. And that's particularly been driven out of the States. If you look at what both Comcast and Disney are doing and the other broadcasters, very much a sort of, of adoption of programmatic as a way to drive uh, revenues moving forwards. So I think that is something that you would see very much coming into the European markets, sort of including the UK sort of, uh, over time. And I think what it also sort of, of would allow sort of the, the broadcasters to do with their AVOD product is to start tapping into the digital ad budgets that are out there. And that can only be a big plus. It's great to have somebody come on the show and look at the year and say, actually, you know, the signs are that we're going to be bouncing back actually quite relatively quickly. If you're talking about ITV forecasting 50 to 75% increase in advertising in April, that's that really is extraordinary. So, you know, if that's a real indicator for the whole TV industry about money coming into the industry and about that, that can only be good news. Ian, thank you for coming on the show. It's fantastic for you to talk through the detail of this new report, the pandemic pause or play. Would you be able to make it downloadable to telecast listeners? Sure. So what we'll send through, there is a link that people can tap on it and sign up for it. 
Lovely. Okay, we'll share that with our listeners. Ian, thanks for coming on the show and uh, hope to speak to you again soon. Hopefully, maybe maybe towards the end of the year and uh, then we can look back and say what a barnstorming year it's been for TV and advertising. Well, who knows? If ITV gets 100% plus advertising revenues in June, I think everyone will be celebrating. Thanks, Ian. No problem. Take care, Justin. Well, we've reached the end of another week's show. As always, thanks a lot for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories you may have missed, exclusive insight and opinion, including the secret producer, our intrepid anonymous exec, reporting from the front line of TV production. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in lockdown three in London. So until next Thursday, as always, stay safe. To celebrate a year of Telecast, we've teamed up with Workshare Consulting to launch the Telecast Workshare Content Industry Monitor. Taking the pulse of the global business of TV, this exclusive regular survey will analyse your views to find out how the TV business feels about the key issues it faces today. So we're asking all of our listeners from producers to financiers, from distributors to networks and everyone in between to please take a few minutes to fill out our survey. We're asking about how confident you feel about your job or business, how you've been impacted by the lockdown, both personally and professionally, how the industry leaders have performed, about virtual markets and events, and the return to a new normal working life and industry recovery. Just go to telecast-podcast.com forward slash survey to complete it. It'll only take 10 minutes and you'll be helping take the temperature of the global TV industry right now. Plus, we'll send you a copy of the full results when we publish in April. Thanks a lot.